We humans are wanderers, travelers, and explorers. From the time that Galileo used his spyglass to show that certain objects in the sky had other objects revolving around them, we realized that not every object in the sky revolved around the Earth. Galileo using the spyglass also revealed that there were mountains on the moon. Mountains. The familiarity of the word brought the sky and these objects a little closer to Earth. We were now thinking of the moons and planets as places to go, places to travel to, and places to explore. Actually, it was more like we were dreaming of traveling to these places. We had little idea of the environment between Earth and these destinations. We had no idea of the environment at these destinations. But we still dreamed of traveling to those places. Centuries passed and scientific progress were made. We now had a better understanding of the environment we'd have to travel through to get to the moons and planets. But this understanding was a double-edged sword. We now knew what to expect, but also realized that getting there was really just a dream. A dream for most of us, but not all of us. At the end of the 19th century, a Russian mathematics teacher and inventor named Konstantin Tsiolkovsky thought of space travel to the moon and beyond not only as possible, but he also wrote a series of scientific papers to show in theory how this could be achieved. A few decades later, with the help of new technologies, many of his core concepts were incorporated into the spacecraft that we now use today to explore the celestial sphere. Traveling in space has fascinated humans since we realized that the moon, planets, and stars are physical objects that we can travel to if we had the means. But for most people, even scientists at the end of the 19th century, this kind of travel were more or less a flight of fancy or an academic study. Yes, we had ideas about how to travel through space and get to the moon, but these ideas ignored the critical investigation of space, the feasibility of the transport system, and the sustainability of humans inside the transport system. The one thing that was apparent to everyone in the late 19th century was that going into space required speed, really high speed. It's easy to see how some people at the time thought of cannons to be the solution of reaching the high speed required to reach space. French author Jules Verne popularized this idea with his novel From the Earth to the Moon, where a group of men inside a special capsule are shot from a cannon towards the moon. There was some research going on at the time with the theory of rocket propulsion, but all of them were a natural offshoot of the cannon. That is, they were based on igniting a powder which then produced a large amount of hot gas. For the cannons, this hot gas would be expelled all at once out of the barrel, forcing out the cannonball at high speed. For the rocket, the hot gas would be expelled over a long period of time out of the barrel. Since the rocket is free to move, unlike a cannon, when the gas is expelled, the imbalance in pressure will cause the rocket to move in the opposite direction as the expelled gas. That's the basic principle of rocket propulsion. However, to be practical, a lot of research has to go into creating a lightweight but strong material, the composition of the powder used, the most efficient way to expel the hot gas, how to sustain the gas generation, and more importantly, how to control the generation of the hot gas. This is where Tsiolkovsky had a different idea of how to generate and control the hot gas generation. His idea was to use a liquid to create the hot gas instead of a powder. Liquid propellants tend to be more efficient at converting fuel to momentum while maintaining high thrust. 
This efficiency translates directly into having a rocket that can travel much further than a rocket that's powered by a powder, or more generally, a solid fuel. The longer the fuel can last, the faster the rocket will go. Speed and longer lasting fuel, the two most basic requirements for traveling among the stars. It was at this time in 1897 that Salkovsky worked out his now famous rocket equation. Though a British mathematician named William Moore had worked out a similar equation earlier in 1810, Salkovsky, who derived the equation independent of Moore, is credited for the rocket equation because he was the first to apply this equation to space travel and orbiting spacecraft. He was also the first to determine the velocity required to put a spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. Here's how Salkowski described his concept of a rocket space vehicle in his work, Exploration of the Universe with Reaction Machines. Visualize the following projectal, an elongated metal camber, the shape of least resistance, equipped with electric light, oxygen, and means of absorbing carbon dioxide, odors, and other animal secretions. A camber, in short, designed to protect not only various physical instruments, but also a human pilot. We shall consider the problem in its broadest terms. The camber is partly occupied by a large store of substances which, on being mixed, immediately form an explosive mass. This mixture, on exploding in a controlled and fairly uniform manner at a chosen point, flows in the form of hot gases through tubes with flared ends, shaped like a cornucopia or a trumpet. These tubes are arranged lengthwise along the walls of the camber. At the narrow end of the tube the explosives are mixed. This is where the dense, burning gases are obtained. After undergoing intense rarefaction and cooling, the gases explode outward into space at a tremendous relative velocity at the other, flared end of the tube. Clearly, under definite conditions, such a projectile will ascend like a rocket. Automatic instruments are needed to control the motion of the rocket, as I shall call it, and the force of the explosion in accordance with a predetermined schedule. What Salkovsky was describing in 1903 are essential parts of a modern-day manned spacecraft, from the life support system to the rocket nozzle to keep the rocket capsule cooled during re-entry into the atmosphere. In this concept, Salkovsky used liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as fuel and oxidizer. He also included a mechanism to cool the rocket nozzle. As for controlling the rocket, he described two methods, using a jet vane, a type of thrust vectoring, and physically moving the rocket engine on a gimbal. All of these concepts are used in modern day rockets and spacecraft. Salkovsky in his paper also talked about the acceleration issue as it relates to cannons. Even though the longer the barrel, the lower the acceleration required to achieve a certain velocity at the end of the barrel, if the length of a cannon is as long as the Eiffel Tower is high, the acceleration required to obtain the necessary speed to reach into space will still subject its payload to about 1000 Gs. No instruments, never mind humans, can survive such an acceleration. But Salkovsky calculated that with the rocket, a liquid-fueled rocket to be more exact, the acceleration can be controlled by controlling the amount of fuel that's mixed in the combustion chamber. The rocket would move relatively slow in the dense atmosphere near the ground to avoid heating and then accelerate quickly to high speed once in the thin atmosphere and space. The acceleration would be controlled to not exceed the limit of what humans can sustain for a relatively long period of time. Salkovsky went further by suggesting that the crew on board the rocket could be submerged in a liquid that has the same density as the human body. Doing this helps the body withstand high acceleration 
by distributing the acceleration force evenly over the entire body. Some flight suits used by fighter pilots today use liquid-filled chambers to help the pilots handle a higher acceleration force during aircraft maneuvering. Getting above the Earth's atmosphere and into space is relatively easy. It takes less than 10 minutes and doesn't require a tremendous amount of fuel. However, if you want to go into orbit around Earth or leave Earth behind and travel among the planets and stars, things become a lot more difficult. Most of the fuel the rocket carries is used not to gain height, but to get velocity, orbital velocity, or escape velocity. Height is only required because the rocket needs to get out of the Earth's atmosphere to avoid friction with the air, which will limit its speed and slow down the rocket after the engines are cut off. On the moon, you can go into orbit just 6 kilometers above the surface, but you still have to fly at 1.7 kilometers per second to stay in orbit. Tsiolkovsky realized that the minimum velocity at the lowest possible orbit on Earth is about 8 kilometers per second. Achieving such a velocity requires a large amount of fuel, but he also noted from his rocket equation that in order to get the maximum velocity from a rocket right before cutoff, you have to do one of two things. Increase the velocity of the exhaust or reduce the mass of the rocket. Increasing the exhaust velocity is primarily a function of the chemistry and the concentration of the fuel used. Reducing the mass of a rocket is not as straightforward. They are both difficult to implement in practice, but reducing the mass requires approaching the problem from a new perspective. Every component of a rocket is crucial, so we can't just discard them as the flight progresses. Tsiolkovsky solved this problem in theory with what he called a rocket train. Today, we call it a multi-stage rocket. In his initial concept, Tsiolkovsky stacked multiple rockets in series, one after another. After a rocket has used up all of its fuel, it will be disconnected from the train and fall back down to Earth. By disconnecting the spent rocket, which at this point is just dead weight, the next rocket in the train will have considerably less mass to accelerate, thus decreasing its fuel requirements while still accelerating the rocket to even higher velocities. Tsiolkovsky concluded, based on his rocket equation, that the rocket train or multi-stage rocket is the only practical way a rocket can go into Earth's orbit or travel to the planets and stars. Exactly the place that Tsiolkovsky truly believed that humans will journey to someday. For a vehicle that burns fuel, this journey is only possible if it has access to air. Tsiolkovsky investigated the concept of a jet aircraft to achieve high velocities without the need to carry the air on board. While this fact made the vehicle lighter, this very air that it didn't need to carry now resisted the movement of the vehicle, limiting its velocity. Even though the jet concept would make a vehicle a lot faster than a propeller-driven vehicle, the need of an external supply of air limited its use in the Earth's atmosphere. Tsiolkovsky concluded that the only way to travel to the planets and stars is in a rocket. A rocket requires an onboard supply of oxygen, but it's not the only thing that requires oxygen. Any human onboard the rocket will also require oxygen. Tsiolkovsky knew of the various problems with humans traveling in space. He investigated many of them and was able to offer conceptual solutions. To create oxygen on board, he suggested using plants. These plants would also be responsible for absorbing the carbon dioxide and other waste products created by humans on board. The plants would also be used as a source of food. Another issue that Tsiolkovsky addressed was the issue dealing with sustaining humans in a weightless environment associated with space travel. He suggested that a rotating rocket along its lateral axis could be used to simulate gravity by taking advantage of the centrifugal force that it creates. All of these concepts are still being investigated more than a century later by space agencies from around the world. NASA has on the International Space Station a project called Vegetable Production System, or nicknamed Veggie. It grows a variety of vegetables that's consumed by the astronauts 
and is used in microgravity experiments. NASA also has a project called Kilometer Scale Structures from a Single Launch. One of its goals is to investigate the possibility of creating the frame of a large rotating space station that can be folded to fit inside a single rocket. Tchaikovsky had pioneered so many concepts that we use in space travel today, it would be impossible at any time to be in space and not make use of one of his concepts, from spacesuits to airlocks to artificial satellites. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky did not live to see his fellow Russian Yuri Gagarin become the world's first space traveler. But we all can see his contribution in the field of space travel. The Monument to the Conquerors of Space is a 107-meter obelisk and a statue of Tsiolkovsky located in Moscow. It can be seen as a reminder to us all to never let the dream of traveling among the stars die. Hermann Oberth, a physicist and rocket engineer who worked on many rocket-related projects in Europe and the U.S., and who the Oberth effect is named after, had this to say to Tsiolkovsky in 1929. You have kindled a light and we shall never let it go out. We shall bend every effort to realize mankind's greatest dream. I'm Dex DFX for the Celestial Sphere.